You know, God created us with healing properties in our bodies. Every, every time a fruit comes out from a tree, you can take it down. Keep plucking the fruit from a tree. It won't kill the tree. It will bear fruit again next year and next year. You can take away all the leaves. It will still bear fruit next year. For by their fruits, we shall know them. So brethren, if you are looking for a standard for judgment, a standard to know God's mind, a direction for Christ. The Bible has given you a direction. It says, judge their fruits. Judge their fruits. Even if they can disguise their words, their clothing, their face, their smiles, but they will not disguise their output. They would not disguise their fruits. Welcome back to the show, guys. You asked for it, we got it for you. In today's episode, we have evangelists from the Synagogue Church of All Nations who have spent a long time with Prophet T.B. Joshua in the past, and they are sharing with you never before heard lessons, experiences, and stories of their time together with Prophet T.B. Joshua. This is only episode one. We're going to have a couple of episodes coming up where we share fun stories, um, uh, experiences, and in depth lessons from evangelists that lived with Prophet T.B. Joshua. And people ask, why are you doing this? And we want to make sure that the memories that we had, the experiences, the encounters, the miracles that we witnessed, that all those things are not gone and forgotten, but that the memories, the experiences that we had, that we can share it with you. We don't want it to fade away in the minds of disciples and evangelists across the world, but we want it to be shared with you so that you can grow from it, you can learn it. You may not be able to go through what we went through, but you can learn from the lessons that we learned. And that's the reason why we do it. If you are interested in following the evangelists that participate in today's episode, check the description below. You can find the social media accounts right there. Also, please make sure that you like, share and subscribe this channel so that more people can find the content and also that you will be up to date when we release a new episode. Fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the show and God bless you. All right, welcome everyone to today's wonderful show. I'm Rickard and I'm here with some wonderful men of God. I can't wait to hear from them. So uh, for those of you watching, I'm Rickard. I was at the Synagogue Church of All Nations for about nine years, uh, living under Prophet T.B. Joshua there. And we are here to share our experiences, memories, and things that really impacted our lives from our time in the Synagogue Church of All Nations and with Prophet T.B. Joshua. So you guys go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, how about you, Ed? Hi, my name's Ed Gardner. Yes, I was also a, a disciple of Prophet T.B. Joshua at the Synagogue Church of All Nations. I was there for over 16 years, and um, it was a place wow. where I spent most of my life, and I, I give thanks to God every day for all that he has done there, in me, through me, and for you. Okay. Um, my name is Martin. Uh, I, uh, I'm also a disciple uh, from TB Joshua. I was spent there about maybe two to three years uh, on and off. And yeah, such a wonderful time. Many, many memories, many lessons learned in life. And I, I, I thank God for the experience. Okay. My name is Cedric and I was also um, a disciple at the synagogue church for 10 years. And it was very interesting and lots of lessons learned as well. And lots of, lots of experiences. Yeah. And so for those I'm, I'm, like the, I'm like the rookie guy. I, I, I'm just there. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea you had been there for 10 years. Cedric. You were there longer than me. I remember no. when you came. You came like a little <laughs> child there, you know. Come on, Rickard. I met you there. Come on, please. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. What's it called? I met you there, Rick and you left Rick me. Rickard did the baby dedication. With <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So that's wonderful. Um, so we're gonna share a couple of our memories and experiences, and and just let you guys know, watching, um, you know, things that we learned that we wish for you to learn as well. 
uh, without having to spend so many years at a particular place. Uh, first of all, one of the questions that people have asked me personally a lot is, uh, you know, how did T.B. Joshua prayed? You know, how was, what was his prayer life like? What was his uh, habits in prayer and so on and so forth? So in general, what I would uh, say regarding that is that, first of all, he, he prayed a lot. He, he believed strongly in prayer rooms and special areas for prayer, okay? He, and of course, he, had, he developed the faith bracelet and everything so that you could pray everywhere. But he was very much about like, you should have an area that is consecrated for prayer. Uh, it's different from the Western culture where people are more like, oh, you can just pray everywhere, you know? Yes, you can pray everywhere. But he, he believed that, you know, when you go into a place that is consecrated for prayer, it's kind of uh, more focused to pray to God, no distractions, you know, nobody can just come in there and, you know, talk to you, you spend your time there. And when you come out, then you're available for people, you know? And uh, so when it comes to how he was praying, I think his prayer life was, was very sacrificial. He would pray um, many times in the late night where people normally would sleep. That's when he would really spend time in prayer. And, and he was many times outdoors prayer, praying. Uh, he had the prayer mountain where he did a lot of prayer outdoors as well. He, he had this thing where he wouldn't sit down and pray ever, basically. He would walk in a circle. And it, it would even be like the circle would be so designated that like you could see the tracks where like someone has walked there a lot in a circle and he would walk in that circle and pray, you know, and he taught us kind of a way that you can, a way that you can pray. And it, it has basically five components. I'm going to see if I can remember them perfectly because I'm not strictly following only that way today, of course. I'm praying as God directs me personally. Uh, but I remember, you know, you start with thanksgiving and then you can pray for forgiveness. Of, uh, then you go into forgiveness of sins. Uh, and then I think you go into confession. And then you go into uh, spiritual warfare where you begin to go against uh, the spirits behind different things in your family and so on and so forth. And then you end... Um, with i think like mercy and favor asking god for like to cover you with mercy and favor and so on so it's kind of like a five-step uh, prayer and, and each section of course had different okay so we had a little bit of technical difficulty there it seems like cetric has disconnected for a minute but he will be back with us shortly meanwhile we're going to continue to share our experiences until then so I was, as i was saying prayer and the different uh, components of prayer you know and all those things were were things that we were taught kind of to, especially when we were going, it was called going on assignment. It meant that you went to the prayer mountain for a one day, two day, or a three day fast normally. Some of the people who were more designated to be prayer warriors, they could go in for seven days. And the fasting that we did there, it wasn't just, you know, you're fasting from, you know, there's different, Daniel's fast is really popular today. You know, you're fasting from this or you're eating only fruits or only having juice. It was no food no water and listen to this barely any sleep either okay you would go on a prayer assignment you would be one or two or three people sometimes more you would go to a particular prayer hut at the prayer mountain and you would pray uh, consecutively in your prayer hut there would always be one person praying so you would pray for example for one hour each so let's say you're three people you would pray for one hour each so for me i would pray one hour then rest two hours, then pray one hour, rest two hours, pray one hour, rest two hours. And that could go for 24 or 48 or even 72 hours. And uh, when you come out of that, I mean, you, you are really close to God. I can tell you that because you're close to death. <laughs> that you have to be close to God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so yeah, those were the kind of prayer assignment so we really learn and, and at th those times many times when you sleep because you can only sleep for two hours and then you're they wake you up and they're like it's your time to pray it's your time to pray so you have to wake up so at any point during these 72 hours you only sleep for like two hours in a row ever during the night or day so and we don't even drink water nothing it's just you and the bible and god you know so um and during those times, many times when you slumber for those two hours, you get really divine dreams and like God speaks to you in your dreams and stuff like that. So I, I personally thought that those were some of the coolest experiences of my spiritual life, honestly. 
And looking back, I really appreciate that. And, and it was, it's just something special when you're in the, when you're in the prayer hut and you're praying, you kind of have a track of time. You know that like, oh, this is three days now. It's three days and one hour already. What's going on? Because normally you would <laughs> wait for, for the prophet to call and say, okay, you guys can finish your assignment now and come back to the church or whatever. So, but those times it was very character building uh, and, and, you just got so close to God. everything else of this world. Everything else just fades away. And it's just you and Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that matters. Nothing. And I felt like I got answers to a lot of questions that I had during those times, really. So, yeah, I guess those and those that was taught by Prophet T.B. Joshua. So he was the one that started that type of prayer in the church, you know, and then he taught us disciples the same the same things, really. So to those that have been asking about prayer and, you know, what's the how did he pray and stuff like that? I've given you kind of an idea of, of how, how he would pray and, you know, uh, I, I can't tell you the exact words he prayed for. You know, it's not like he's telling us everything he prays. You know, obviously, but those were kind of like the atmosphere or or the surroundings of uh, when you were for prayer. Prayer was taken very seriously. It's not like, oh, good morning, Jesus. Uh, have a good day, Jesus. See you later today. You know, and then you proceed to do your stuff. It's you go in. You know, you pray, and that's it. You know, so. So yeah, the sacrifice of time. That yeah, really yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of my memories. What, How about you guys? Hmm. Well, I just uh, uh, to add a bit yeah, more yeah. to what you're saying about prayer. Yeah, like um, the the when you go for the um, the prayer and fasting assignment, it was also very different when the faith bracelet started coming out and when that became a a push to get people to meditation as being the form of prayer that the Bible talks about. Pray without ceasing. Um, that he would be, yeah, that's not a place where you just go into any room where you use the secret inner room of your heart. That should mm -hmm. always be a place of prayer, whether you're in public or whether you're in private. And so those kind of prayer points are, I, I think, very helpful for someone, especially who is starting to, and their relationship with God, like at a, at a beginning level of prayer, doesn't know what to pray or how to pray or why they should pray or whatever. It's a great way to start having those kind of um stages in mind and let the holy spirit start leading you slowly and surely and yeah. one of the the big things that he taught us about prayer that i remember is that it's we don't actually know how to pray as we should it's the spirit that speaks through us and guides us so it's a question of the more you yield to the holy spirit the easier it becomes and the and the kind of better level you get to um, mm -hmm. The more you do that, the more you obey his suggestion. Like you hear, they often signs the, the devil on one side and God on one side, and you see someone shifting to or between. But it's actually a very good metaphor for real life. The more closer you get to God, the more you keep listening to the suggestion of the Holy Spirit, the easier it becomes, the louder it becomes, and the more frequent it becomes. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, I, I, I always put it to the scripture that says, if you are faithful in little things, you'll be trusted with more. Yeah. Um, I think that applies even to the, the life of prayer and obeying the Holy Spirit in, in little things too. Then he gives you bigger things and greater things that are, that are your own as well and, and things that he will directly lead you. And this is where it comes into relationship, which is, I, to me, I think what two of the biggest things or three of the biggest things I learned from Prophet T.B. Joshua was relationship with the Holy Spirit, the meaning of grace and the meaning of faith. Those are the biggest things that I can say um, his ministry impacted me. What do I mean by um, by grace? Let me see. Great, uh, or, or let me start with relationship. That's the first one. Um, you are supposed to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ. And it's not your parents' faith or your pastor's faith or someone else's um, relationship with God can't save you. I've never heard that before. I always believed in, you know, that that was not where my faith was at until he said it, until he taught it. And look, Jesus Christ, Christ came and died and paid the price so that you could have everlasting life. Everlasting life is with him. It's all about with Jesus. He came, uh, you know, to restore the relationship with God and man that was damaged through sin. That relationship is what Jesus was always targeting. And it's not what we always do by default. We always are after other things. We always are after relationship that I may have healing. Relationship that I may have blessing or other things. Relationships mm -hmm. kind of like how you get there or a byproduct. But for God, that was always the main thing is yeah. the relationship, the love uh, of God. 
And so, yeah, that really, really struck home to me. And a lot of times you would see this in how he resolved issues. If there were ever problems or crisis between people in the church, his response was always back to keep the relationship with God, build relationship with God. Yeah, you have your rights. Yeah, people shouldn't talk to you in a bad way or you have the right for this or right for that. But it's not as important as your relationship with God. You, Someone hits you, you may say you have the right to hit back, but God isn't happy with that person that hit you and he's not happy if you're going to hit them either just because it's your right. So rather look for your relationship with God and how your situation affects that. You are never um, presented with a choice. You're always presented with a challenge to your mm -hmm. relationship with God. And that was something that I always thought, wow, whether the world laughs or frowns at you, it is an enemy is what he used to say about that. And I said, yeah, this is true in every single sense. Everything is a test of how much do you love God? How much are you actually committed to um, your relationship with him that you've started? So, yeah, just wanted to share that. And um, uh, can I still go on? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, like uh, what I said about um, the meaning of grace, uh, I'll say... One of my, my, my first experience of TB Joshua was when I met him in the year 2003. Uh, no, wait, I met him before then. Um, I was a disciple in 2003. I met him in the year um, uh, 1999, I think it was. Um, so, yeah, I was about 12 years old. And um, <laughs> uh, we had been invited to the synagogue church for nations. My father uh, was a friend of some pastors who used to go around to revival zones. Any, anywhere they hear the Lord was breaking out and doing new things they would go. So this trip, he happened to have the grace to go with them on that and uh, discovered the place, loved it. So 1999, we went as a family. And when we got to the, the church, as I just stepped into the threshold of the big, then it was still the one with the ceiling fans and like the, 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 the dust place, not the one you can see on TV today on Emmanuel TV, but the older uh, third stage building. We got in there and just this amazing peace came over me like I'd never experienced before. It's the peace of God and just said, this is home now. This is where you belong. I was like, wow. You can imagine a 12 year old boy going on holiday for like, I don't know, is this the second or third time I've gone on holiday to another country and suddenly this is home. I was like, whoa, this is different. As our, as our feet touched the, let's shall I say, the holy ground of the synagogue church of all nations, one of the workers I, who I later learned was a disciple came rushing and said, hey, the prophet's at Prayer Mountain. He wants all the, the kids that have come as visitors to come and see him. We're about 12 from different countries. I was from UK, obviously, then we had people from Germany, from South Africa, um, all around the same age, 12 and 12 and below, really. I think I was one of the older ones. So. Uh, we got swept off, off from our parents with a, we didn't even look back or anything, man. We were running. Yeah, we want to see the prophet. Because by this time, I'd seen lots of his old videos of like amazing miracles and healings that were going on. So I knew exactly what he looked like, I thought, but I'd never seen him. And I, of course, I'm going there for a week, but really what I wanted to do was see the man. So, okay, let's go. We jump into a bus and we drive, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes away from the church. And they say, here we are at Prayer Mountain. All the kids, you know, faces up against the window say how oh, what is this place and we see no mountain we see no rocks we see no huge we're like they said mountain mm. you want to go to the mountain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like uh, the mountain is was not a physical mountain they said it's mm -hmm. a spiritual mountain because this is where the ministry started we're like oh okay that's the story okay let's go yeah I, so, I, I, when i came to i want i was looking for a mountain and it was more of like a valley <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the the valley that that sounds right but if you say prayer valley and prayer mountain i think mountain sounds a bit more yeah uh, agree with that <laughs> so yeah there we go we go in and um <coughs> the the wooden boards um planks that you walk all the way through connecting the places then the waterway hadn't gone as big as it was now it was starting and um, we got to the, the end of the jetty, and there he was, smiling, I don't know, the smile of Jesus, or like say, eyes shining, teeth shining, face so happy to see these kids. And each one of us were like, oh, that's the guy. <laughs> that's who I've come to see. That's, that's the, I, I don't know what celebrity to name it to, but there was a celebrity was in front of us. We were like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he comes forward and starts shaking everyone's hands until he gets to me. I said, can I give you a hug? He says, really? Okay, it just laughed about it. You know that kind of laugh he always did? <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, this guy, yeah. So I hugged him, and some of the other kids were jealous. So before you know it, all these, like, I don't know, 12 kids are just bundling on TV Joshua, and he's just laughing and giggling. Okay, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Let's go. I want to show you the new thing we're starting today of opening the waterways of Prayer Mountain. 
doesn't mean anything to us at the time, but then it was like they discovered the root of where water was in this kind of area, and they were digging it out so that the place would become like um, a kind of, the plan was to make it a prayer resort, wasn't it? And yeah. so, yeah, that was where it started. He took us into four big, huge canoe boats, and we had a worker in each boat, you know, trudging, um, what do they call it with that pole where you kind of stick the pole at the bottom of the of the river and pull it across? Anyway, that was how we yeah. were doing it. It wasn't like paddling, but like, um, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know, pulling and pushing yourself yeah. along. Um, I was lucky to get into his canoe, and so we were going off until we found a place where um, one of the pine um, uh, palm trees had fallen down into the water and the pine palm seeds were growing. So he then took one off, one of them off and gave one to each of us for like a little souvenir of our first time at the mountain. I was like, oh, I've never even seen a palm tree before and now I have one. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was my first memory of seeing him. That was on a Saturday. The next day was Sunday and um, he started at the prayer line. He didn't start in the main church. And just looking at him, you could see there was a huge difference between the lovely fatherly kind of man that welcomed us to the mountain and this man that was here in on behalf of jesus right now faced mm -hmm. with a line of sick people people with diseases cancers and you know really grotesque stuff in those those earlier days of the ministry um i mean boils things that you could see this this should be amputated this should be cut off there's no way this gets healed but just like in the ministry of jesus everyone who came to jesus christ was healed they testified the pain left immediately so he was there and he said, Look, we're going to pray for these people now. I'm not the healer. Jesus Christ is the healer as well as one of his most you know, commonly said things. But the difference between me and you is the God to do this. And then he, he would go and in, in 30 seconds, he would clear a bench of about 15, 20 people, just stretch his hand at them, say you're free. And the person will start shouting, yes, the pain's gone. You know, that's the biggest relief to those people that are sick with like terminal or, or serious conditions is that they've just been used to a lifestyle of pain. So the moment that pain goes, they know, they know clear as day that it's over. And that reaction was all the time. That was always what happened. Um, so yeah, and that, that's what I meant by the other big lesson was the meaning of grace. So many other people I've seen pray for people and you kind of get a bit disappointed you're like oh is the prayer not answered or, or what mm -hmm. happened but the, the grace that there was that he that he lived under and that was on him and his ministry and those that followed him things that didn't happen for other people happened for him without trying and one of the stories i would have to to demonstrate about grace was um a time he took me to pray and fast um at the mountain in his hometown um it was myself and one other guy and him and he was going like right uh, he told everyone at the church right i'm going for uh, uh, three days to a week to go and seek the mercy and favor of God over something. Uh, so he left the church in the hands of the, the junior pastors and things, and off he went. And he's like, when we got there, it was blazing hot sun, you know, mid and oh, yeah. we actually went up to the big mountain this time, hot, sweating. Oh, so there we were. And he said, Right, guys, I don't know. God said it's going to be at least three days to seven days i'm here to humble myself before god and pray so uh let's just put uh, some kind of tent uh and shade over there and then uh when you're done come and join me on the rocks he took no food no water no bread nothing with him just like that um into the wilderness just a place for him to lie down and and, the, and a mat for the floor that, that, that was pretty and that, like um, a cover for shade and his bibles and his books that was it so we get there and uh, there when we're finished, he's lying in the middle of the hot sun on the hottest, biggest rock that there is, just deep in prayer. And so I just kind of like then thought, I don't know what to do. What should I do? <laughs> I just started looking left and right. And at almost at that moment, my thought even, he opened his eyes and said, oh, hey, come down and sit next to me. Let's pray together. I was like, whoa, no way. I come on and pray for him. Pray, pray next to him. He says, yep. This is what it takes to humble yourself before God. So let's pray. And he just lay down back on the rock and started praying. And he said, just pray whatever God puts in your heart. I was like, whoa. My first prayer point was answer him. Whatever he's here for, whatever he, bless him, answer him. Let this answer immediately. So I was there, I don't know, maybe two hours, maybe three hours there. Then uh, I noticed that he wasn't moving anymore. I don't know if he was praying or asleep or in spirit or in trouble. I don't know what was going on. I was like, okay, let me just see if I can make his bed area more comfortable. Maybe he wants to have a nap. So I sneaked away so as not to make any noise. 
did that. When I turned back, he had stood up and was coming towards us. Right. God said the prayers answered. Let's go. I was like, no way. <laughs> that was it. Was supposed to spend three to seven days here. He spends three hours in prayer, and God answers him just like that. I was like, yeah, that is the grace of God. Mm -hmm. That uh, that's so amazing. Then, yeah, the last big thing, big lesson I learned from TV Joshua is faith. Um, what it means to have faith is is not a feeling. Faith is not a feeling, and that was the biggest thing. By that at that point in my Christian life, feeling was everything. If I didn't feel good, if I didn't feel God at a place, I didn't have a good service or a good meeting yeah. that day. You know, it, that that was just it. But he said, no, no, no. Whether you feel it or not, God is good all the time. And oh. that, that just took on a totally new level. And it made perfect sense when you look at the scripture because God is always faithful. He can't be unfaithful. So if you said you've gone to a church service and you didn't really feel God there, your feeling is not God. Your feeling is not faith. Faith is always the same yesterday, today, and forever because it's based on the word of God, which doesn't change. That gives you a whole new level of perspective of, hey, so yeah, God really is good in all, all the time and all the time God is good. What, what am I battling with then? That's the real question. Not a matter of is God good or is God there mm -hmm. or is God with you, but yeah, so a matter good. of where, what are you actually focusing on? What are you actually paying attention to? Yeah. Uh, which is distracting you, frankly. So take it from a level of you don't have to feel or see it before you have it in God. Um, as God who calls things which were not as if they are, that is the highest level of faith. When God said, let there be light, there wasn't light. There wasn't anything at that point. That is god's level of faith to say right light and then all of creation followed it so in the same way that kind of well his biggest teaching i think if you if you google it and look for it then the biggest topic always has the word faith in it what is faith faith confession faith is a man of faith this and that everything was about faith to say look this is the key area you are missing and it you're not missing it as in a currency you're missing it as in recognition of what you already have you if jesus said faith of a mustard seed is all it takes to uproot a mountain and cast it into the sea why are there so many mountains in the world and in people's lives that are not being moved surely if you have any faith at all you have a mustard sized uh, mustard seed sized amount and this was what started hitting me that yeah why do people pray for things and they don't see things happening the difference of standing in feeling and standing in faith and I think that was a huge revelation that he gave that has impacted pretty much every other area of your life after that. So, yeah, these are some of my mm. fondest memories and uh, lessons I learned from Prophet TV Joshua. That's awesome. Yeah, um, well, for my short ex uh, experience that I was there, um, the biggest thing that I saw was the, the training ground, how it was um, being used in different methods that um, to be able to to get your character built that he was really concentrated instead of the, the talent or the gift on the character. And which, which is to me was really, really kind of like awkward. I'm like, well, if you have the gift, wouldn't you just, you know, operate in that gift? But he was just like, it's not about the gift. It's about the character It's more character character. And that's why the, the, the place was there really was kind of tough because Prophet of Joshua would concentrate a lot on the character building because he knew that God would use people in different areas, not if that if God will use God will use them, but it's going to be your character that's going to maintain you uh, in the place where God's going to take you. Mm. And um, that was for me is really good because I know a lot of people are, are going to different prophets and places and they're like, oh, just pray for me so I can have your anointing. But it's it's prophet Steve Joshua aim was look, it's not about your the anointing, it's about the the character that comes. Uh, that you have because that will facilitate and that will um, usher the anointing to go further um, in in life, in business, in marriage, mm -hmm. in all these things. That does, the character is the one that sustains whatever God's going to give it to you. If your character has holes, be afraid to ask for anointing because it will it'll break you, it will crush mm -hmm. you. You know, and he always talks about the high places are slippery places that God wants us to take you to a better place, bless you. But if you don't have character to maintain a blessing, it will it will it will hinder you. Know it will be more of a burden to you. And uh, seeing that training, yeah, the training was tough. That's it's no no doubt. The the ways, the the tactics, the different things could have been done differently. But for for the area that they were in, I think that's that was just a, a great training ground to build 
to stand upon the word of God, not bad feelings like Ed talked about, you know, just the, the prayer, such a, such a huge emphasis on prayer that when you visit the church, there's a prayer mountain, there's always prayer, there's always prayer. But just to show you, this is, this is a man that's walking, uh, you know, in line with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is guiding him. And that was my really experience in that. I really, um, to me, you know, when I first time came to be able to see the deliverances up close and, um, you know, how a man can stand and just stretch his hand, not even touch him and, and the power of God would just move. And I'll be like looking up a hand. I'm like, is there something coming out of that hand or <laughs> is there something, something, what is going on? And then just seeing that up close, you're like, wow, this is, this is it. And, and being, being had having a chance to be part of that that was just that was just amazing so yeah yeah i remember one thing as you were saying uh, is there something coming out of the hand uh, or whatever there is actually this uh, prayer technique i don't know what you guys uh, know about <coughs> this uh, maybe ed being there for so long maybe you have uh, know something more than i know from the time i spent there but there is a way that prophet tb joshua would pray for people that I've never seen anyone else ever do. And I've heard some people say like, oh yeah, it's, it's because he's doing this or whatever. And I'm going to explain. So, you know, when there's a demon, he would pray. And sometimes he would do this. So I'm just, I'm just sharing this because I think it's really interesting. He would like pull, pull in the spirit kind of, pull the demons or something or like pull them back and then like throw them and then move them and like do it to the side and like i've not seen that happen almost in any other ministry not to that degree he would even demonstrate it i remember in the early days where he would be like oh you know the person would be facing the other way even he would be like okay i'm taking i'm taking him in the spirit now i'm like holding him in the spirit and like pulling and the person would without seeing him move the direction that he's pulling him and stuff so I think that was really cool. Do you have anything when it comes yeah. to that, Ed, like any experience or anything considering that you, so I, I was there from 2008. Okay. The church had already gone through certain, uh, how can I say it was a little bit more, I'm sorry to use these words, but it was, he had been a little bit more Westernized. Okay. Like the foods were a little bit more, like you could find a little bit more Western food and stuff like that. Like back in the early days, it was African food. It was, you know, it was the pounded yam. It was it was the ebba and stuff like that. So, so you have a little bit more an earlier experience. Do you have anything like regarding the prayer technique or anything? You know. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the big things. I mean, we asked him all the time. <laughs> what does it look like? How do you do this? I mean, these are the questions we wanted to ask, especially before like Emmanuel TV came out and things really changed when it got so like global and worldwide. But before then. Um, he would spend so much more time. He didn't have time. Once Emmanuel TV happened, everything had to become faster and slicker and more streamlined because there wasn't time for it. But in the early days, um, I mean, a deliverance wouldn't happen in one day. People would be arrested on Sunday service and then delivered on Monday or delivered on Wednesday. And what used to happen in those days was he would command chains, angelic chains or angels to come with chains and bind the demons while still in the person <laughs> the person would now be bound to the floor their their legs together and their hands separate so they could now crawl on their bum anywhere they were going but they couldn't stand up and he even um had there were some professional wrestlers in the church at one point he said okay go and try and separate their leg because they're just sitting you know with their legs crossed and they're like take your hands and just force their legs apart try he couldn't for the life of him. And this was a, a professional wrestler, a strong guy, you know. So <laughs> he was saying, this is this is kind of, kind of what I mean by different grace. I saw grace upon him that I've never seen anywhere. Some of the things that he said for were like, this is not something you can do all the time, but it's a grace given to you. Like right now, I'm given the grace to, to demonstrate how much greater God is than the demons that are manifesting. I'm given the grace to show how much more powerful the name of Jesus Christ is than any power these things said. I mean, some of the confessions you hear in those old days were shocking, startling, and frightening. Some demons say, I have three powers, power to kill, power to seduce, power to this and that. Then some demons come and say, I have 1,500,000 powers. You're like, whoa. <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like when God brought like a bigger level of deliverance, he brought a bigger grace upon Prophet TB Joshua to be able to handle it in a way that wouldn't, um, allow anyone to be afraid of the demon but rather he would 
almost be seen like playing with them or, or even bullying them sometimes just to show how much more in control God is. No mm. matter what level of darkness they had achieved, the light was always stronger. And um, a lot, I think this is one of my other favorite things. He, he loved to teach people, even when he was doing deliverance or doing healing or anything else. I mean, one yeah. of the most amazing things about him was the, the gift of tongues that he had was a different grace than the gift of tongues a lot of people have. If you ask a lot of pastors to speak to tongues, they still start, you know, making, making sound. But he had it down as the gift of like a language that he could speak. And there was a time that he demonstrated this where he went and prayed for someone and said, okay, God is going to give you the gift of tongues and he's going to give me the gift of interpretation. And so he just touched the person and they started speaking. And not, not that kind of tongue that you're used to hearing, but it, you could tell this was some kind of language coming out of the guy's mouth. And then he just put his hand over his own head and he started speaking. As the guy was speaking, you could say, like almost translating word for word. You know how it sounds like when someone's like saying what doesn't know what they're saying, but just one by one. But it was just so incredible to see that, yeah, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are all there. They all work. They're all real. As you've heard about it in the Bible, they are 100% today. The, the, the question is grace. Everyone mm -hmm. is called to save souls. Everyone is called to be a, a missionary, a witness, and evangelist. Not everyone is called to prophesy. Not everyone is called to do gifts of healing. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that's different. Um, so, yeah, the fact that you're not moving in the, I would say, the grace or the level that TP Joshua does shouldn't make you feel any less of a, of a minister of God. You are used yeah. by God and it's God doing and it's not you. In the same way, it was God moving. It wasn't Prophet TP Joshua that was doing that. It was God through him. Um, but a lot of the times, yeah, the level of teaching, he really wanted to be someone that equipped the church to, to know how to handle these kind of situations and he especially would have grace to do like um when he had um teaching with uh pastors uh, um in those days he held pastors conferences for like 50 to 350 pastors at a time sort of thing and he would go and write on the board teaching and then he said okay let's demonstrate god uh we're gonna use the gift of tongues right now i'm gonna write in tongues on the board and he would write something and said that's a tongue and people would something people would start shouting people would start uh, try it down perfectly in their notebook you know and say okay this is the name jesus christ written in tongues and he would write it on right on the boards looks like squiggles but hey those are the cool squiggles so from there um people would say right okay now i'm gonna write just jesus christ in english and he wrote it and he gave he called one of the pastors up with um a chalk uh it was a chalkboard we were using those days and he, he gave him a dust to say right rub the name of jesus christ off and he just walked up and you know as you were just off Okay, now try and rub out this tongue. In the name of Jesus Christ, do not, was what he said to the tongue. The man now then tried and just froze on the spot until he fell over, just in the spirit. And he was like, a moment later, someone tried to, to get him up, and they that touched him fell down next to him. And he was like, <laughs> so you see there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. this is what I wanted. To. So oh. those kind of demonstrations, you don't see them anywhere. You don't get them anywhere. Yeah. But that's the level of grace that prophet tb joshua was under yeah. um i don't think it's something that you could explain all the time some of them sometimes like with those deliverances you see him like they walk the whole church or they spin around and round and round i think there were specific revelations that he got sometimes he would tell us when the disciples went back to jesus he said why couldn't demon possessed boys that are this one fasting sometimes would ask why did that one spin round and spin round and said oh yes it was to do with how the problem in, affected their life it's to do with where the spirit was in their life just things that would blow your mind and you wouldn't really understand you start to question really where is this i don't understand i don't see but i guess that's why he didn't do much public teaching on it because it's something that was a revelation to him from the holy Spirit. and if you say a lot of that to a lot of people people are going to question you people are going to say i don't have any any background or any basis in this or anywhere in the scripture I can find to say, yes, this is confirmed. But that was what happened. And I mean, the, the video volumes themselves for themselves to say this was a man God used to do. This. So, yeah, that's what I would say about it. There, there wasn't there was never a, a, an instruction booklet on that one, sadly. of Yes, when you come <laughs> up against the spirit of a snake, do and do this and do this. That would have been great. Huh? But no, that wasn't. It, it was all all yield to the Holy Spirit and he'll guide you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I, I think we have, we've all shared some of our experiences and stuff. I think 
Uh, to round up this, uh, we don't want to keep people for too long. I know some people will be enjoying this content a lot. So uh, to people who are watching and they want to try to do whatever is in, in their, whatever is their role to get to a level similar, like they want to go as far as deep and as high as they can. Uh, in their journey with Jesus Christ. They want to be used by God strongly. We are uh, some people who have watched, witnessed a lot in someone who has been used by God very powerfully. So I want to ask you guys, if you could give one advice to a pastor out there or a Christian who wants to try to get, you know, who to get closer to Jesus uh, following examples that maybe we have seen or whatever, what would be one of your guys' advice? And I can start if you don't mind. I think one of the most important things that I think should be passed on to people from the life of Prophet T.B. Joshua, how he lived his life, is that when you get to a certain level with Jesus, nothing else matters anymore. Like, we lived with the man for, for so many years. He didn't have a hobby. He had no hobby. He didn't have a personal life even. He didn't have, you know, he didn't go on vacation with his family. It was Jesus 24-7, 365 days a year. There was nothing else. And I think that's really important. If you want to be used by God, you want to grow in your relationship, you can't have a plan B. There is no plan B. Jesus is your plan A and B and C and D and E, F, G and so on. And I think that's, that's a lesson that I think I look at my life and I'm like, oh, I know I, I need to still, you know, reduce the time I spend on my phone. I need to reduce the time I do this. I need to do this. You know, there's so many things that like, when I look at how he lived his life, like, he, he, he had nothing. There was nothing to his life other than Jesus. That was everything. His whole life was just church. He lived in church. He worked in church. He only left the church to go to pray at the prayer mountain and then came back to the church. I never saw him. He, he didn't like, oh, it's 10 p.m. Let me catch this movie. You know, he didn't watch movies. He didn't even use phones. Someone else called people for him. You know, he was all about just the Bible. In fact, he didn't even know how to use an iPad. Like it's super easy. He didn't even he didn't even <laughs> give give so much effort into learning how to use an iPad. He was it was Bible. I'm talking, you know, John the Baptist style. Like he, there was nothing in this world that mattered to him other than Jesus. And I think that's a big lesson to learn when we're looking. We're like, we want to have the good stuff. We want to have the sweet stuff. We want to be used by God. But the price that is required, it is truly to leave everything and follow him. You know, like Jesus said, leave everything and follow me. So I think that's, that's really one of the lessons that I wish uh, people would, would uh, take on and understand the, the amount of sacrifice it takes if you want to be used by God powerfully. What about you guys? Do you have any, any lesson I, or anything? I think on, on my end, um, you know, the, lo looking at the life of Prophet T.B. Joshua is the, the emphasis and the importance of prayer and the Bible, the Word of God. Um, those are the key aspects because right now, I feel like the, the, the biggest um, lie sometimes or, or facade of the church is, is the gift of speaking, the, the, mm -hmm. the gifts of this or that, but not the, the emphasis and the importance and the teaching of prayer and the Bible and, you know, just walking close to the Holy Spirit. So that, that's my suggestion. It's, it's just coming back to the basics of, of living and exemplifying a life of prayer and, and the word of God, having the word of God being part of your life and just, just living that because, you know, that's, that's how Jesus did it. And um, that's how his disciples did it. And we believe as a church also, or as, a, as Christians, we have to live an example of that, of just dependence on God's word, you know, our relationship with him and nothing can, can come between that.
I would say to those who want to follow in the footsteps of Prophet or want to go as 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 far as hard as, as well as he did, um, don't miss a day with God. Don't miss a day from reading the Bible every single day. If it's one chapter you read, read that one chapter and pray and spend time with every day. That's the biggest thing. It's relationship. When you build that, the extent to which you that is the extent to which it will overflow into every other area of your life, into your family, your finances, your career, your ministry, and whatever else you're doing. Um, when you don't have a relationship with God, is when you fall back on them. But when you have a relationship with God, then every other gift happens automatically. It's, it's a byproduct of the relationship you have. So see that as your most important thing. Humility is the biggest sacrifice that honors God. Many people say of Prophet TV Joshua, he was a humble man. Not, not humble because he had nothing, but humble because of how much he knew he depended on God. True mm. humility is total dependence on God for everything. Yeah. And you think a man that got as famous, that got as powerful, influential, as wealthy as him, would start to begin to sit, sit back and say, ha, thank God, everything's going well now. I've worked hard. Life is going good. No, not at all. The greater things were, the more he humbled himself, the more his crusades went amazingly, the more, he, the more charity he gave the next day, the more um, miracles were happening, the more days he would go and fast and be before just to say thank you for for doing this yep. you know so it, if you want to start really growing in the things of god appreciate the little things god does for you and humble yourself as a result of them then god himself will lift you up and exalt you hmm. yeah. really good words of wisdom they are dropped by you guys uh i think we're gonna round this up here uh Cedric has been texting me now saying that his internet for some reason has died so we might have to do a uh, another you know where we let him share some <laughs> well it's so annoying internet right the technicalities <laughs> of this world ah oh, you know i'm sure the apostle paul and the and the guys back in the days they would have been using internet a lot and they would be like oh i call thunder on the spirit of internet lagging <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, i want to thank you too for spending time sharing your experiences and uh, we'd love to see you, you soon again awesome awesome yeah all right thank you the holy bible itself warns us about false prophet that is matthew 7 verse 15 to 20 it reads Beware of false prophet who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. The Bible says you would know them by their fruits. It has given us a way to dictate has given us a method it means they can disguise they can disguise their words but it's impossible to disguise their truth that they'll go out there in sheep clothing but inwardly they are wolf but you can know them by their fruits and there's no way that you can deny fight or destroy the foundation and the output of these testimonies. The testimonies are the mirrors. Just look at all these amazing, tremendous, powerful fruits. I mean worldwide. You will know them by their fruits. That is 16. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or fig trees from thistles? Even if every good tree bears good fruit,
Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit eats cut down, thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. If you are still doubting how to know them, how to know false prophets, how to know false teachers, prophets, the Bible, the Holy Bible, the greatest teacher of all time, has given you the answer. The answer is, by their fruits you should know them. Don't go by the stand or what they say, but check out for their fruits. And upon that stand, we call upon all the accusers. Now come with your fruits. Let's check. Let's have a check on all your fruits. And our conclusions has been drawn. The Bible made it clear. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs of tissue? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree, a corrupt tree. Now look at the word corrupt. A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit, and a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit for by their fruits we shall know them so brethren if you are looking for a standard for judgment a standard to know god's mind a direction for christ the Bible has given you a direction. It says, judge their fruits. Judge their fruits. Even if they can disguise their wounds, their clothing, their face, their smiles, but they will not disguise their output. They would not disguise their fruits. Their fruits will tell you either they are real or fake. And to that we want to thank God for using his servant, Prophet to be Joshua, to raise up men and women hunger for Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost, reaching out this hungry generation, reaching out the world with the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we are not blind that we cannot see. For the Lord has opened our eyes And we are not deaf that we cannot hear. For we hear the sounds of gospel songs and the revival of the end time gospel rising. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button as a way to support the channel. We are grateful for all your efforts.